Hello and welcome everyone. Um, this is the Radix DeFi Roundtable. Uh, we will be doing an hour and a half deep dive into the path to decentralization of finance and a few juicy topics along the way. Super happy to be joined by the folks we have here today. Uh, and to kick it off, I'm going to hand over to our moderator, Jack from Masari. Thank you for that introduction. Um, thanks everyone for, for joining. We have a awesome panel ahead uh, with some of the most interesting projects, in my opinion, uh, helping to shape the future of DeFi. Um, so I guess to kick things off, we can do some quick intros. Uh, I'll start with myself. Um, so as Pierre said, my name is Jack. Uh, I'm a research analyst at Masari, which is a uh, market intelligence service uh, for crypto. Um, I'm a research analyst in the space, so I spend my days reading and writing about DeFi all day long. and uh, even then, still feel like I can only keep up with 10% of uh, all that's going on due to the insane pace of change um, due to a lot of what these, uh, these guys are building. So without further ado, I'll let them kick things off with their introductions. So I'll go first. Uh, my name is Piers Ridyard. I'm the CEO of Radix. Um, Radix is a decentralized finance protocol uh, specifically focused on bringing decentralized finance into the mainstream and solving all of the problems um, that is currently faced by uh, platforms like Ethereum with things like scalability issues as well as things like composability uh, and making sure that the right incentives are in the right places for communities to be able to build uh, effectively on public ledgers. Um, I'll uh, pass over to Stani for the next introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Stani. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Aave. And, and Aave is a uh, money market uh, protocol on Ethereum. Uh, and, and basically what it allows you to do is uh, to deposit uh, cryptographic assets such as stable coins and earn interest. And also you have a credit line to borrow other assets. Uh, we started a couple of years ago with ETHLEN, which was uh, first lending protocol. And the current the the money market protocol Aave we launched on January, and since has uh, since then has been um, grown su substantially. Hi, I'm uh, Matthew from Argent. I'm the head of strategy and operations. Argent is a smart wallet for Ethereum, offering uh, one tap access to the best of DeFi protocols like Aave, but also Compound, Token Set. Maker, um, Uniswap, and others, um, and also we offer kind of peace of mind through things like daily transfer limits, being able to lock and unlock your wallet in a tap, um, and whitelist contacts. Awesome. Hey guys, I'm uh, Johan. So I work on everything that's integration related over at Chainlink. Chainlink is basically a decentralized oracle network, giving out. Currently, I mean, our aim is really to give out oracle functionality to the whole space and to any use case. We've been mainly focusing right now on price feeds and financial instruments uh, that uh, DeFi projects can leverage to get the tools they need to basically build their applications. So, yeah. Hi guys, I'm Greg DePrisco. I'm uh, the head of business development at the Maker Foundation. The Maker Foundation is the entity that uh, shipped the original code for what became MakerDAO, which is now a self-governing organization that produces the stablecoin DAI. Awesome, so to kick things off, uh, I think it would be kind of pertinent to talk about this balance between centralization and decentralization, where in order to kind of like fulfill the right ethos of crypto, uh, a lot of these DeFi protocols, the intention is to be these community owned um, protocol that are absent of like any central point of failure. But uh, with that being said, like that comes with trade-offs of, um, you know, efficiency, given that decentralized governance, like it's, it's hard and takes time. So I think it'd uh, be pertinent to start with Stani, given uh, you guys recently made some pretty major announcements on Aave's plan uh, towards that uh, more gradual decentralization. So I think uh, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Stani, on if you think that that's uh, an, an effective way to think about it, where you know you can start out as a more centralized company and then work your way towards uh, giving more rights to token holders over time, or what are your, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, actually, that's uh, that's quite a uh, interesting uh, question, Jack. Because like, it really depends on what you're building and what kind of model you're uh, searching for, and also kind of like what's what's uh, uh, kind of like the sufficient decentralization uh, is. Because uh, in in some cases, like if you think about decentralization, I see it as security, and and security brings additional uh, costs. 
whether it's it's basically the underlying network, uh, the blockchain network, or a, a DeFi protocol. And and basically, how I see it, it's going, the 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 vision here is that um, you need enough uh, basic decentralization that you have security in the protocol that allows those kind of like permissionless non-custodian functions without uh, violating uh, these particular uh, properties. And I, I think in, in many cases, uh, many of the development teams, they definitely start from quite zero. So you, you need to somehow obtain funding or somehow to get uh, get moving. And, and in, in most cases, it has been in, in past with a some sort of a sale or a private sale or equity raise, and then basically uh, kind of like converting into a token or doing it with the, or with the uh, liquidity mining. But um, I, I think like uh, definitely like it's it's a path, it's a journey. I, I It's very difficult to be from the day one and most uh, kind of like concerning aspect there is that uh, if there is some sort of um, misconfiguration or uh, uh, some issues with the design of, of the uh, protocols, uh, then it's very difficult to um, kind of like uh, quickly apply changes if if you don't have uh, kind of like a Genesis centralized um, uh, team there. But at the end of the day, kind of like taking steps toward decentralization is that what uh, I see that most of the DeFi protocols are taking. And that's, that's what we are doing at Aave as well. And the the economics that we published uh, is basically a kind of like a, um, I would say like a roadmap on on how we are going to transform for what we are today and 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 basically to be more decentralized. And uh, we kind of expected to um, take this decision a bit later, but uh, the amount of uh, value that is locked in our protocol kind of like urges us to do it uh, more sooner uh, than later. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, so, Greg, I think this would also be uh, a, a good question for you, given Maker's been, they've you know had a decentralized governance process for quite some time. It's very established now, and you probably know better than most the, the difficulties that come along with that. So do you kind of agree with that sentiment, or do you think it's possible for uh, a project like um, Yearn, where right they're trying to just release tokens in the wild and say, you know, governance, just like do your thing? I, I don't know the answer to the second part of your question because that that is something that can only be tested empirically. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I, I think the important takeaway here is that decentralization is the innovation of our companies. That there's a bunch of other things that we're doing that touch on innovation, but the only actual innovation is the decentralization itself. And the pace of that innovation is going to actually decide which companies are the most successful, in my opinion. So if Yearn can do it in a week, then, you know, they're, I think they're going to be spectacularly successful because that means that they've innovated faster than all the rest of us. Uh, I don't know if they will be able to do it in a week because as you pointed out, we've been in the trenches with this stuff for several <laughs> years now and it's, you know, it has its ups and downs, but uh, innovating is hard. I, I, I almost think of uh, the history of roads. So, you know, if you think about the way roads operated in the United States prior to, uh, I think it was the Civil War. They uh, they were private. They were private structures that were used for the benefit of their owners. And you know, people soon realized that this infrastructure was just too important to have in the hands of a few people. So roads became public goods. And I think that's the the trajectory that you need to see these DeFi protocols take. Where rather than handing it over to the state, you're handing it over to a group of incentivized participants that can govern this infrastructure like it's a public good and therefore don't have the same perverse incentives that a, a small group of controllers would have. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good analogy, actually. Um, I, I haven't heard that one, but kind of makes, uh, makes a lot of intuitive sense. Um, so then, Matthew, so I think uh, as a centralized like company that is building on top a lot of these like base layer protocols, you probably have a bit of a different view here. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious to hear, like, as, uh, right, this, this, this central, centralized company, but, like, you still have stakeholders, you still need to create a, a business on top of that. Like, how do you guys think about value capture in a world where, like, everything's open source and, like, there's very low switching costs, like, between protocols? Um, 
Yeah, um, it is a very good question. Um, and I see that uh, you or someone in your team is just posting about how aggregator theory applies to Argent and other wallets. Um, and I think, yeah, I think you're unlikely to see a specific project own a consumer relationship in the way that aggregator theory is sometimes applied to people like Netflix. And in a sense, as participants in the crypto world, we don't really want to own um, you know, a consumer relationship in that like locked in sense. That's not really the point of crypto. Like, of course we want to grow our user base. Um, and of course we want to add value uh, for the stakeholders of Argent, but we're not looking to lock certain people in. So yeah, it's super easy to leave Argent um, if you're not liking what we're building. And we've kind of, even though we're a centralized uh, company, building the wallet, we've always ensured that the fundamental aspects of it are decentralized. So Argent can never touch anyone's assets and we can never block anyone from using their assets. And you can even use any other Ethereum wallet to move your assets out of Argent. And I think that's really important to build trust with the community. Um, and yeah, I haven't really had enough time to digest your kind of the tweets on the aggregator three points, but I think there are some things that you know, even though it's open source and it's easy, after a while, the project does build up a reputation. Um, it does build up trust with people, which has been really important in this space. And we're seeing over time, people add more and more assets to Argent as they hear from word of mouth. And, you know, the more assets in, you can kind of take it over time that maybe it's getting safer. And so we've now got wallets kind of with up to, um, and actually a few wallets with over a million dollars in them. And I think that's not so easy to suddenly switch to a new project because they've got to go through that and have, again, the years of audits and battle testing. So I don't think it is super, super easy to say that we'll never kind of capture the relationship. Just on a couple of the things that people have been say, saying, I think there's like I think we often lump decentralization into one big topic, or it can end up being lumped into one big topic. But there's this, uh, I think there's several sort of like key points inside the concept of decentralization that 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 it, it's nice to sort of tease out. The first is this this idea of anti fragility, right? Which is like we want to make sure that if if any of our companies blow up, that what we built keeps going that if there is a utility and a function that that is that is useful for the communities that we're building up that that can continue to to go for like way outlive the the people that designed it and the people that created it that you're trying to create a perpetual motion machine that is building value for the people you care about right um and that's that's sort of the anti-fragility on sort of two levels the first is from the point of view of the protocol how do you make it so that the protocol is a self-sustaining uh, entity that grows and, and builds brings value in and brings in users and brings in developers and then the next level up like as a as a application creator how do you make sure that what you've created fundamentally can can outlive what you what you guys what the, the team that first built it which is a fundamental difference from like a bank or or something like that but from um, from the uh, from the other side, like we often talk about decentralization from the point of view of governance and decision making, um, and that is that, that's a that's an aspect of 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 anti fragility, but it also like often has a load of problems with things like um, not getting sufficient um, uh, buy in from the community because they just just don't want to vote more than anything else, or like not actually not actually getting the engagement you need to be able to make decisions, and that often ends up with some forms of centralization where you're like, okay, well, we're going to have some sort of representative democracy or we're going to have some sort of like smaller class of entity that we decide should be making decisions for the good of the community. You want that to be able to have, you know, a to be anti-fragile, but it's not necessarily decentralized in like the way that you often think about a protocol as like, it's something can blow up. Like if, if the people that have been appointed to be those representatives disappear, you're going to end up sort of um, in, in a similar problem um, that will take a long time to recover from. And then there's this last aspect of like interoperability or permissionless of funds where like it's really important that, that this is, this is the key in innovation is being able to move assets from any pro from any sort of like application to any other application without needing 
uh, permission from a centralized authority to do so once you own those assets, they're fundamentally yours. But I think that for us to grow beyond just that now, with there are going to have to be, like if we want to bring things like um, Tesla stock or Apple stock across to, to these platforms, we need to start thinking about gradations, like the protocol matters as a decentralized entity and, and permissionless. And then the the uh, application that's dealing with these assets also matters from that point of view. But at a certain point, there's an interface with the real world that may actually need a central central body to be able to go between the laws of the land and, and what you want to happen on the protocol. And that's fine, as long as it's not breaking the rules that you're setting to make sure that these applications can interoperate and that we can end up like continuing to drive users and values to the, these protocols. So I was just going to... Um... Add to that, I think that's exactly it. it's like where does where do the various elements of decentralization add the most value to users? Because for us, in the moment, it was decentralizing smart contracts, the assets, building agents, so that if we disappeared, people could still have control of their assets. But actually, to make the decisions day to day and to actually build the product in our first couple of years, it made sense to operate like a traditional startup. And then gradually over time, as we learn more about how these models are working, we can kind of evolve to a more open and decentralized model. Yeah, I just want to say that it's it's interesting to me that we're seeing this friction and kind of desire for decentralization in legacy companies as well. You know, you've got the biggest tech companies in Capitol Hill this week talking about how they don't have monopolies and stuff, where it's obvious that the Internet's network effects lead to natural monopolies. And the friction is not in the fact that these companies have them. It's in who controls them. And it's pretty much everybody pretty much agrees the government shouldn't control Facebook, but we all kind of also agree that maybe Mark Zuckerberg shouldn't be the only person that controls Facebook. So it, I think there's just this obvious need for decentralization all over the economy. And hopefully the structures that we're building today could be applied on a much larger scale. Yeah. Also, I was about to say like some of the aspects of decentralization, which are often underestimated is also like someone has to do the work at some point, right? Like if you're going to write smart contracts, if you're going to run Oracle infrastructure, someone has to do this work. Now, we're kind of in a, in a, this crypto space where you have so many teams, you have so many great ideas, you have something which is always moving super fast, right? If an application doesn't really decentralize on time and keeps the whole kind of governance process, keeps the whole decision process, runs their own Oracles, uh, so they have to have their own infrastructure, all of this stuff, right? Is they don't have really the time to iterate or kind of to to focus on the right things, right? Because they're already kind of concentrating all of the powers. And something which was really uh, quite fun actually was this um, when Wiren kind of released their first article about why they were decentralizing and why they wanted their, this governance process. They said explicitly it's because we are too lazy to govern. And here I think something important is. These guys are indeed very busy to code and to do many things at once, right? Like they don't have also the time to kind of oversee the whole way the platform works and decide the token economy and all of this stuff, right? So I think that's why it's another aspect which is really why decentralization is so enticing in our space, because you want to leverage all of these great ideas, right? You want to leverage all of the great people. Uh, that's something we've seen with our oracles, right? Like uh, you're incentivized as a team to not run your own oracles and to kind of rely on some kind of decentralized oracle network like, like the one Chainlink has for price feeds because you don't want to have monitoring around your price feeds. You don't want to be running your own node. You don't want all of this stuff, basically, right? Like that's a lot of things which could go wrong. And I think that's another aspect of decentralization, which is super important. And why in the long run, I see decentralization winning just because it's the law of, um, of the many instead of the law of a centralized entity, which would be controlling something. And here, if we can see something throughout history, including Ethereum, because Ethereum was really the space where innovation was possible compared to other blockchains where you know innovation was a bit more restrained. Uh, I think what, what this showed us is that if you open up the space to innovation and to make as many people iterating as possible, and you don't have this kind of force leading the way above and taking all, all of the decisions, this approach ends up winning in the long term, right? Uh, at every step of the way for oracles, for governance, all of these stuff, that's always the right approach. So, yeah. Yeah, th th those are all uh, great points. And um, you're right, it, it comes down to decentralization. It's not just like a black and white kind of thing. There's, there's a lot more nuance to it. There's uh, many different stakeholders and actors within these 
uh, within these communities. Uh, but Piers, you said something interesting about, right, maybe one day, like, you can still, like, bridge the world of, uh, right, centralized finance and bring something like Tesla stock uh, into a decentralized protocol. And I know MakerDAO has uh, done some of this with their, right, it's a distributed governance process that decides to bring in an asset like, you know, so far like stable coins or, you know, I've seen some uh, myth nines on like tokenized invoices or like other other assets like that. And so um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Greg, to hear your thoughts on the, the trade-offs there between like still trying to have the majority of the system, you know, quote, like trustless, but then also scaling it by, you know, if you could tokenize T-bills or you, know, you have the most liquid large asset in the world, like that could help die then actually grow to meet its like large goals. Um, you hit a nerve in my eye because the, the notion that decentralized collateral is in any way better than having a, like a, a diversified portfolio of centralized and decentralized collateral is, I can't stand it. <laughs> it's, it makes no sense. I mean, think of this. So right now, let, let's say you have a stable coin that's exclusively backed by Ether, right? What happens if the centralized on-ramps get shut down? What happens if Tether blows up and all the liquidity disappears from underneath the currency in a day? Like th there's actually more risk to leaning only on these quote unquote decentralized assets that are completely dependent on centralized on and off ramps, as opposed to having a ver diversity of assets which have tons of different ways to uh, onboard. For instance, you know, if you're using uh, some sort of regulated asset, a, you have the legal system of whatever jurisdiction that you're registering that asset in to, to lean on. You don't have to worry just about uh, you know, hackers or anything. They could steal the asset and you can still get it back. But also, it's a completely different way to on-ramp into the ecosystem. And it's actually the way that most businesses on-ramp into money in the first place in the legacy economy. If you go to a bank and you bring them a house, they print money against that house. You don't have to go to a bank and buy their own currency to then deposit it in the bank and then borrow money. That, that whole concept just doesn't make sense to me. So I, and also it just doesn't scale. You know, you, you can never predict the value at risk of any asset over an extended period of time. It, it's literally impossible. I mean, so many, so many people have blown up trying to do that. Like lo long-term capital management is probably the best example, but uh, it, 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 you know, it almost happened to Maker with March 12th. Thank God it wasn't as severe as it could have been. But the point is that a single asset stablecoin, the, the, the example that I draw there is like, imagine that there is a bank that only lends against vineyards. Like, would, would you want to have your deposits in that bank? No, because they have no diversification. You, you want a currency that is backed by a truly diverse form of collateral that diversifies you not just against financial volatility, not just against centralization or seizure risk, but every risk across the board. I'll end my rant there. No, I like I just to, just to sort of add to that. I think that is the only way that we're going to grow beyond the sort of the the crypto echo chamber that that, that we sort of exist in. Like the um, yes, there's 250 billion dollars of 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 crypto assets that currently exist and many of them haven't yet accessed DeFi. so there's like a huge opportunity there to bring those in but beyond that like if we're actually serious about rebuilding the financial ecosystem as it exists today to something that actually leverages all the, the power that we get from these 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 platforms and services being on a interoperable trustless framework that doesn't mean that the assets themselves have to be trustless they'd like stable coins have already shown us what the value of having a the ability to express an off-ledger asset on ledger and then be able to program it that's incredibly powerful but we've like we're only just scratching the surface of what the main market liquidity actually looks like and what's possible to bring into these and like i i would love to instead of having you know i'm going to go hark on about apple but instead of having apple in my like merry trade account to be able to take apple and put it into Aave and then be able to get a loan against that and be able to do that in a second rather than it just being on these little islands of nothing that that, that they, they are not compatible with each other and i think that's sort of the underlying power here so it's like not decentralization for decentralization's sake is decentralization for the things that matter to be decentralized from the point of view of anti-fragility and trust and then getting as many of these assets on top of these ledgers to make them in com compatible and to be able to build all of these excellent new things that we're able to do now yeah and i, I have to agree on the like basically kind of like the 
I, I think when we think about like the discussion of like um, decentralization in, in terms of like um, the the custody aspect, like uh, there's always some sort of custody risk or like centralized. Like uh, I, I I agree definitely with 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 everyone that like we should not think too much that let's say if we have a stable coin backed by only it that it doesn't have any kind of like uh, uh, centralization risk. I mean, there's also always social capital that is intact into that and and. And I think uh, basically being able to uh, have different kinds of as uh, assets on Ledger, like a distributed Ledger, we 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 kind of see that the 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 bigger value proposition actually is the uh, inter interoperability by default. Because uh, the the biggest thing I see now in DeFi, like for me uh, personally, is is the that the we have quite interesting way. Uh, of having capital ef efficiency and, and moving capital from from one place to another, uh, we have kind of like not succeeded yet to uh, make that capital work uh, efficiency efficiently enough because we are looking value. So the current metric is that we are looking value into smart contracts and and and, and basically you 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 should not be looking value; you should be basically utilizing it as much as you can. And I, I think bringing different kinds of assets into um, the 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 public ledger and and even adding privacy on top um, it it brings a lot of valuable uh, uh, primitives and and efficiencies and if the whole finance was like this by default that could be something very interesting I mean what we're looking with the the um, protocols that basically run by themselves is basically being as a uh, infrastructure backbone. Uh, for the, the finance, and I, I think DeFi is just one thing, uh, and eventually it's it's, it's going to be uh, basically the, the backbone of everything else cool that will happen on on chain. Yeah, we tend to agree. Also, that I mean, to me, the main concept of DeFi is that at some point it's bound to replace traditional finance, right? And that in the future, traditional finance would basically be what we call today DeFi, right? And to do this. You basically bring, like, you need to bring these assets on board. You need to bring, uh, you know, Tesla shares, Apple shares, all of this stuff. Because once it's tokenized and once it's on the blockchain and once it can interact with permissionless systems and this decentralized kind of governance and communities, that's really when you open up a lot of doors, a lot of bridges, right? So I, I do really agree with uh, with the points that have been said. And yeah, I mean, also like diversification, you know, to go back to, uh, to Greg's point, uh, seems like something which is extremely important whenever you're creating uh, a collateral basket for a stable coin, right? And you mean as, you you need as much decentralization as possible. In my opinion, whether it's from custody risk asset or whether there is non-custody, I mean there is always a risk as a, as as it was being said. But yeah, so yeah, that's my two cents on this stuff. If we want to really be serious about this vision for DeFi and kind of bring DeFi to the masses. We need these bridges with the real world. We need to bring uh, all of these assets, whether centralized or not, to the blockchain and leverage them and let them flow kind of in this economy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I always do kind of find it funny that there's somewhat of some cognitive dissonance of like, you know, crypto purists that say they want a stable coin backed solely by ETH, but like that's not really any more like decentralized in the sense of um, like what you want out of that in terms of mitigating like a blow up risk, which again, yeah, we almost saw on Black Thursday and like a more robust system would be one that has a broad array of assets uh, with the carefully managed risk systems like we see in the traditional finance because there still is a lot of things like we need to learn from the system that has existed for a lot longer than, you know, DeFi. Um, but so keep, keep keeping on that trend of bridging the, these two worlds right now, uh, Stani, um, Ave recently joined the Chicago DeFi Alliance, which for those who aren't familiar, uh, it's uh, an organization that uh, I believe it's like DRW, Jump Trading, um, CMT, like a, a lot of these like big prop trading firms and, uh, you know, traditional finance companies that are starting to work and like mentor these DeFi projects. And so we're seeing kind of a, a meshing of both worlds. So I'd love to hear, like, how are those legacy players viewing the space right now? Is it just kind of like a neat toy? Are they taking it seriously in terms of the uh, broad reaching goals that a lot of us 
um, kind of see for the future and what brought us to our occupations or what are, what are the kind of thoughts there? Yeah, I think I think they're very interesting. They're interested in the space, like uh, what we're doing, and and also like um, uh, in the growth, and 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 definitely like the the, the value added what what you can have from DeFi, and and kind of like um, DeFi always has been a bit of like low in terms of liquidity. So so the concept of of um, uh, let's say lending pools or um, basically. Uh, Oh, the way money market uh, pools is is relatively new concept, a uh, couple of years old uh, in in maximum, and 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 basically now that there's more liquidity, it it, it kind of gets more traction. But I, I think like one of the the challenges is uh, there's two challenges I think when we look at the the uh, the, the prop de- trading firms and and then our um, DeFi protocols is that uh, first is uh, we are still too small, so kind of like even if there is some sort of like a business to do, like in terms of like the market making, uh, making liquidations on lending protocols and so forth, it's still very small. I mean, um, two billion um, kind of like a market size is very small. And the second is that the the accessibility and 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 the security. So how they can interact with DeFi? It's a completely new uh, form of technology for for these firms. I mean, they. Uh, they have been used to to program things that are related to uh, uh, stock exchanges, futures exchanges, and so forth, and using uh, fixed protocols and so forth. So, so basically, they have completely new thing there. And one of the things they're worried uh, also is is basically the security. Um, the the hacks this year with flash loans and so forth didn't help help much, like to put any comfort on on, on that space. But but the cool part is that um, there's more insurance products coming. Uh, many of the uh, uh, DeFi protocols have some sort of like a risk bearing element. For example, I mean, in terms of Maker, there's there's the MKR and even Aave is basically moving towards uh, staking and minting uh, facility to to basically provide uh, this kind of like a safety ness and 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 comfort. And I, I think that's something that's uh, still a bit of challenging. Um, and of course, like uh, for institutions that just want to originate loans or uh, do basically uh, lending activities, uh, for them privacy is a big thing as well. And um, yeah, I, I mean those those are the kind of like top topics. And and uh, the, the 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 cool part is that they're very interested, but uh, the steps that needs to be taken, the tools, uh, st- basically statistic data, all of those things need to basically. Um, uh, kind of like uh, uh, develop a bit further. So I, I think we're still we're still not there, but we're almost there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that that was some good insight. I, I can't imagine uh, people accustomed to the legacy financial world realizing that every transaction is on chain and viewable by the entire world. Uh, I can't imagine it makes them too comfortable. But um, of course, I like to open that. Gas and scalability is 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 one of the things because um, uh, some of these transactions, like what they're used to, is is very high frequency uh, trading alike, and and then you have a different kind of element now, like a uh, basically where like every participant are paying the the participation cost on on spot. So that's a that's a new element for them as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, so I'd I'd like to open that that up to. Uh, the other panelists as well, if if you guys have had any experience, um, you know, wor- working with uh, the the legacy financial world, and like if if you've gotten any interesting insights from them on, on how they're kind of looking at DeFi. So I, in another, I oh, go ahead, Johan. You you guys actually probably talk to a lot of people. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, on our side, we we were kind of looking into how we can get more and more data. Um, on chain, right? And this data could be, you know, it could be commodities, it could be forex, it could be maybe at some point stocks, indices, right? So uh, surprisingly enough, what you're seeing more and more is actually there is more and more opening, I would say, to these new ideas. And I even talked to some traditional people who actually heard about DeFi, have never used it, right? Like we can't dream too much, but they they've heard of it, they understand the concepts. Um, so what I'm really seeing and what I've been seeing for the last few months is an opening uh, from traditional players towards the DeFi ecosystem, right? And I think uh, something like Chicago DeFi Alliance is probably a good representation of that. 
I see more and more people who want to work with us to get traditional data on the blockchain, right? So I see that people are basically opening up because if two years ago you went to them with a use case and telling them we want your data on a public ledger, Ethereum, anyone can use it to create any prediction market or any kind of uh, <laughs> uh, gambling application or anything, like they would probably you know, be a bit scared, which makes sense. Um, but today, I think they're realizing that it's not as scary as they thought, right? Like uh, they, they can basically start servicing this world and the first players to do it will be extremely well rewarded, right? Because I do think that what DeFi is demonstrating to this kind of traditional world is that we can do things much quicker with much better iteration. And basically, this, uh, kind of, um, the potential is, is huge, right? And I mean, you just have to to be acquainted with traditional markets and see how they work exactly. And then to start using DeFi, which is barely eight months, like, okay, a bit longer with Maker, I would say, uh, well, two years old, if we take, uh, <laughs> if we take Maker's launch. Uh, Four years. Uh, like, uh, around, uh, I don't remember exactly, <laughs> it was like two, two years, right? <laughs> but these bags under my eyes were early. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so, I mean, it's really hard not to see the potential of what's been created in such a short amount of time and where we are today when you're from the traditional world, right? So I'm really seeing this opening and I'm really seeing more and more people being acquainted. And I do think that's extremely beneficial because we do need this infrastructure from the centralized and the traditional world to get brought onto, onto DeFi at some point. And we do need these players to get more and more involved. So, yeah. I think what I've been seeing is is sort of an interesting gradation of risk versus liquidity um so what i mean by that is like the risk profile of crypto is super super high um for the, mo- the majority of people who operate in the crypto space um but then like with products and services like MakerDAO and um and Aave and things like that is bringing in like more traditional um controls around creating assets that have like a lower risk profile to them and at the same time things like continuous function market makers like uniswap bring more on ledger liquidity this is starting to be attractive to uh players that are working what it's called financial players that are sort of working in the high risk area of traditional finance so if you look at things like uh, people who are trying to finance uh wheat growers out in the usa which is 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 sort of cut off from the everyday financial markets but there has a huge amount of cash um, on hand that's available to sort of finance borrowing and trade finance and all that kind of stuff. And then you also look at like places that have non-deliverable currencies. So like Mexico or um, uh, Korea in, in some cases that, that uh, like it, it's difficult to move their currencies between countries and um Greg, you'll probably have a load of experience you can share with regards to your your stuff in Argentina as well. But fundamentally, currency controls combined with local economies that are actually quite good and burgeoning, combined with like high high risk traditional finance players who are just looking to crypto and going, holy crap, there's a hell of a lot of liquidity here. And there's a lot of demand for yield. And if we create products in the right way, we can potentially bridge that sort of um, demand for liquidity in one format into a demand for yield on the other side. So I think that that sort of start, that's the sort of starting to see um, where, from from my perspective, where traditional players are really looking to try and push into crypto. Yeah, m- most people don't realize this, but DAI is actually the most popular cryptocurrency in Argentina now. It's more popular than Bitcoin. And that's a good segue into the point I wanted to make, which is you can't imagine how little the average person cares about our philosophy. They like, and I say this as somebody who's probably more ideologically aligned with the average crypto person than anyone else you'll meet. N- no one cares about our ideology. They don't care about decentralization. They don't care. Like, they, they care about freedom, but in a very loose context, not in the specific way that we do. They, all they care about are the tangible benefits of that decentralization. And for Argentinians, it's that DAI is a dollar that the government can't control. <laughs> That's what they like. So, you know, I, I think we need to, as much as we all want to endorse our philosophy and ideology, it's great to put that into our products. But we have to remember when we talk to the, the customers on the other side of the aisle that that's not what they're here for. They're here for the, the benefits of the technology. And we have to show them that those are real. 
Yeah, and I think like one of the coolest thing is that um, like basically um, interest bearing accounts in terms of like a tokenized form. So so you could hold, uh, let's say something like a die, which is uh, basic a die deposit in in Aave, and it generates you this interest bearing token, which algorithmically uh, increases as your savings are increasing in the protocol. And basically, that's say a uh, global permissionless um, U.S. dollar nominated savings account, and that's that's pretty cool in in places like where the the local economy is um, isn't functioning well, or uh, you you kind of have the local currency issues. So I, I think like uh, this kind of innovations we will see quite a lot, and especially like derivatives uh, derivatives in in the sense that um, they deviate a bit uh, for example uh dai which is a a, a stable coin a dai which is basically uh kind of like an interest bearing savings account and we'll see like more and more this kind of different uh flavors of dai <laughs> and and that's like one of the coolest thing because you can tokenize this like rights and 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 like give a permissionless access because one of the things always has been issue with DeFi uh, more previously than now is the user experience, uh, for example, before days of Uniswap. But now you, you basically can have this kind of like uh, uh, interactions just by holding this piece of tokens that give you right to something and, and or, or reflect a, a position or a product somewhere. And that's, uh, that, that's very like uh, game changing in terms of uh, adoption. Yeah, we've seen... Um... Uh, uh, user base in Argentina is now, I think, almost the second biggest after the US. And that's actually a lot thanks to the maker team in Argentina have been hugely supportive. But, and in terms of like the long term vision of Argent, that's really what I think excites us a lot about DeFi. It's basically this kind of US dollar savings account that easily earns interest. It's available to anyone with a phone and internet connection, um, can be really powerful. And as you're saying, like people don't care about decentralization, but if they can get those kind of benefits that make a meaningful impact on their life. It could be very powerful. Um, but yeah, to be honest, you know, with there's a couple of problems, obviously, today with gas prices, um, it just doesn't make sense for some people to move small amounts of their income um and especially you know if they're not earning that much and also they're new to crypto and wanting to test it out that's quite a big barrier so that's something that we're looking to um solve um with other people in the kind of months ahead um and also where crypto touches the traditional financial system so those fear on ramps i mean they're not you know there's basically there's still room for improvement in europe and the us and um it's even harder with some of the banking system in Argentina and in Mexico. So that's something that we're really looking for, kind of hopefully the community to help solve in the months and years ahead. Jack, just in the just just as a flag in the interest of time, should we move on to the the next topic? Yep, I was about to uh, change course there. Uh, so um, it uh, it wouldn't feel right to have a DeFi panel and not talk about uh, this yield farming that is seemingly taken over. Um, so to, to kick things off with that, uh, I think like one way I have looked at yield farming and kind of explained it to people that don't necessarily get it is it's, you know, similar to like a type of referral program where a company is giving away equity to incentivize useful behavior on the network. So, uh, this actually isn't something like a completely new idea. Companies have done this before, uh, jet.com, uh, they did it for, whoever could get the most referrals and then they end up getting 300,000 referrals. And then the winner ends up getting $10 million or will later be worth, you know, that much in equity. And so it's, it's kind of this unique incentivization mechanism uh, that is a lot easier to do in this crypto native land uh, where you have more flexibility over the pseudo equity like token. Um, so do, do you guys think that that analogy holds true? Um, and that this can actually be an effective way to incentivize behavior that is invariably like useful um, for the protocol itself. Who do you want? Who's got the hottest take? <laughs> I, well, I, I can just say one thing about basic. I, I just think like the the liquidity incentives are pretty interesting because. Uh, incentives has always driven uh, some sort of like uh, utility, uh, even like in blockchain level. But let's say I, I think the the first kind of way of DeFi um, to some ad- some certain like 
kind of like adoption was basically getting yield on your uh, stable coins. And, 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 and basically that was like a, the, the first thing. And now we're seeing basically get, get yield and get a bit of like equity. So uh, they definitely have uh, some interesting aspects, but I, I think it's just one part of why you are using products or services. Uh, I, I kind of think that there's multiple reasons uh, for users to pick, pick a protocol and there might be security um, considerations, usability. So it's of course not the whole picture. And of course, like the liquidity that comes, uh, it comes in all shape or forms. And uh, most of it might be very like a uh, liquidity that, that leaves away after they, they have farmed amount of uh, tokens. So it's not always like um, black and white. So I had to think about how to describe this to my dad the other day because he read an article and he's like, what's yield farming? And I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> uh, I realized it, it's just, it's nothing new. It's, it's user incentives. You're, you're just, you're paying users to use your product and that's great. But it's, from that point, it's about what you do with that liquidity. You know, it, it's, it's almost like you're throwing a bridge across the river and now you're, it's up to you to cross it. So but, but one thing I think is really cool about it is that in the traditional landscape, if a company gave an incentive, it really only benefits that company. In this landscape, it benefits the entire ecosystem every time any company does this. So when Compound launches Comp, it benefits Maker. But when, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Wi-Fi, whatever. When Yearn does a token, it benefits Comp, it benefits Earn, it benefits Maker, it benefits everybody. So it, it's showing, A, the power of these decentralized networks and how they interoperate. But B, it's giving us a huge opportunity because whether this liquidity is going to stay or not, it's there. And if we can now piggyback off this liquidity to, to entice larger participants to get into the ecosystem because they, they can now access it at a scale they want to, then who cares why it was there? It, it happened. Yeah, I, I fundamentally agree with that. Like for, from our perspective, the way that we look at building Radix and, and the ecosystem that we want to sort of uh, build up around the Radix Bros call, we look at three key things, which is access, liquidity, and choice. And like they drive each other. Access, like how easy is it to get my assets into the ecosystem? And that's like existing assets, like crypto assets, but also like assets that currently don't exist in the crypto ecosystem that need to be there, like we were talking about in the previous topic. From the point of view of liquidity, like liquidity drives so much of what's important in finance and the more that we're able to drive that on ledger the higher transaction volume you can have the cheaper the costs are but also the more that attracts more people to come and build new new products and services which is is that choice aspect like how many things can i do on ledger with the assets that i have there with the liquidity that's there so as you drive that developer adoption you build more and more products and services which in in turn drives more people wanting to come into access the the ecosystem in the first place and you get this you get this um self-perpetuating spiral i think if we just look at liquidity and go oh yield farming is like creating these these incentives that is driving not real or like somewhat inflated user growth or somewhat inflated asset growth. What it is actually driving though is not just those assets, it's attracting new users into the ecosystem, but it's also making people who are building the next generation of decentralized finance applications going, yeah, I really want to get involved. This is this is what I want to do, and I and I have a great idea, and I'm gonna I'm gonna build it on this platform. And so while it's sort of this temporary, it may be this temporary thing. What it is is it's driving real innovation and driving people to really build things that are going to drive that next wave of adoption as well. Just uh, on the adoption element, I think from our perspective, where we really have such a wide range of users, including some who are completely new to crypto have been introduced by others already in the space. Um, we, like Piers and the other people on the panel, are really excited by the traction that that area is getting and what it means for the future growth of the space. But I think we're also not underestimating the, some of the complexities involved, even in terms of the language, like what is yield farming? You know, like trying to explain this in a mobile app and in our support documents and to customer like, we would yeah we're just obviously monitoring it closely to see kind of the new projects that emerge how they're explaining themselves what the impact might be on users um there's just a lot to unpick there for new users to the space that may see 
the lure of a high yield and not quite understand the risks that it comes with. Um, and I think, again, the benefits of being a kind of open decentralized community is that some of those risks are flagged quite early. Um, but yeah, that's just something that we'll obviously have to balance as a kind of as a mainstream wallet in the years ahead. Is there uh, a question about the sustainability of this, though? Because like when it comes down to it, all the capital that's flowing back and forth, like it doesn't really care about, for the most part, the you know, future success of any individual DeFi protocol, right? Like I like to think of it's the it's mercenary capital capital. It's going to wherever it can make the most money. And we we kind of see that with uh like bat on compound when right they kind of didn't realize that from the start it incentivized people to deposit some of these like smaller niche uh assets because then they'd have higher interest rates due to like the curve and then people just absolutely flood the market and then the second it changes it leaves. Um, we see the same thing with Yearn, where they have this short liquidity mining program. Uh, they get $400 million and then it ends and bam, back down to like double digits. Um, so like, is this actually like helping them or is it, is, is it going to be a, a short stayed, um, you know, there while it lasts, it makes some money and then get out. I mean, in my opinion and here I, I mean, yeah, so the Oracle part doesn't have much to say with uh, legal farming, but I just put my kind of personal uh, opinion there. I, I think the great thing happening here with yield farming is that it kind of incentivizes, incentivizes innovation, right? Like whenever you're in this kind of very high growth period, you do see a lot of innovators come to the space, build cool ideas. And if we're always in a period, you know, kind of like in uh, after 2017, when the, the whole hype and everything started dying down, um, like these periods are great to build, but I feel like the period of very high growth, like these ones are great for ideas, right? Ideas pop up and then for two, three years, they get built up, you know? So I do agree with you that one of the risks is that we could have uh, protocols really lose some of the benefits they would have, you know, like they, of course, they won't retain all the liquidity and they won't retain all of the users they may have when they're doing some very high kind of uh, growth campaign where they get, you know, maybe one, like when users get 1000 APY weekly or something like this. But I do think still there is a lot of retention that comes and that the base IDs are always born in this kind of uh, very, uh, very kind of high growth situations, right? Like uh, uh, all of the stuff we've been seeing in, in DeFi for the last few months has really been fueled by this uh, yield farming, in my opinion, right? And it's really been kind of uh, a big catalyst for all the innovation, right? Like uh, Ave Economics getting published uh, yesterday, all the yield farming combinations. We see Wi-Fi, which launches on a Saturday, no one is looking for it. And then uh, three days later, there is $300 million of, of liquidity on the pool, while DeFi was barely, you know, was barely any, like it was a few, maybe 50, 60 million, uh, five, seven months ago. And you see this crazy innovation where stuff starts rising, like, uh, you know, like this to a few hundred millions in a few days. I think, you know, these, um, these aspects of very high growth, which are fueled by yield farming can't really be understated, right? Because the innovations we'll see come up right now will be the same ones that will be driving the space in the next two, three years. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that the key metric is are these, you know, yield farming programs bringing new assets into the ecosystem? And whether, you know, no matter where those assets reside in any given point in time, at that point, you're fighting for a piece of a bigger pie. And that, and that I, is what I think is important. Yeah. And I, I think like one, one, one interesting thing that you could actually incentivize, I, interesting enough, haven't seen some sort of like incentives that basically... Uh, collateralize your like ghost chain coin here and 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 get like uh, ERC uh, uh, 20 equivalent and also like incentives on on top and like you, you could really incentivize all kinds of uh, behavior and as, as as I think um, Greg said well it's it's basically mercenary funds that are moving one place to another and not caring about smart contract risks that much and just trying to get grab a bit of uh, yields, but that brings like the the other part. Like uh, I I think like we uh, when the incentives are high, uh, the stakes are high. Like we we tend to not look that much into the security aspect, and then we get like 
days like um, the Black Thursday or the, the flash loan attacks, and then then we don't we again talk about security, and then we forget it again when the the sugar rush of, of the yields incentives come back. And I I think that is something like um, which uh, we should focus a bit more because even the underlying networks are focusing on security uh, in essence. And why shouldn't the the, the protocols and things build on top? I um I think there's one thing that sort of is also potentially risky with this, which is nothing to do with the the sort of like the the compounding of of risk by sort of like layering of financial instruments, which I think is also like something that's interesting to talk about. But um, there's a potential in the way that this is developing, especially on on product on pro- uh, protocols like Ethereum, where scalability is is an immediate concern that's pushing up gas fees. That we're essentially going to be pushing out the 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 the, the person who just wants to come and try it, like the ever the, the the actual people that we're trying to get to. We're at risk of just ending up having a bunch of really big whales moving things around between projects and 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 uh, and and making a return and then leaving like on the on the on the point you said jack like uh, mercenary capital like i think all capital is mercenary just on different timelines um like pension funds work on a 20-year timeline and crypto currently works on a you know one week timeline but ultimately they're all trying to do the same thing which is optimize for return but i think that what like to, to greg's point in sucking in these assets and getting more people involved and in involving more than just sort of the the small internal um uh people who just understand exactly how this stuff works there is there is this risk that's currently occurring with things like ethereum that is meaning that people are looking at it like and going wow i don't want to spend 30 bucks on a on on a transaction fee, um, you know, fundamentally something that Radix was it, it has been built to address, but I think that it's going to be an ongoing problem for a while for for where the community lives, which is Ethereum, um, and I think that that's something that is being caused by yield farming and stuff like that. So, Greg, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, so, to my knowledge, Maker's not going to be doing any liquidity mining anytime soon. Um, but given that it's been such an effective means of uh, attracting liquidity while, while it's lasted, do projects that like ha- aren't going to be implementing any liquidity mining like does that put them at a competitive disadvantage? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, at the end of the day, people want the best product, and your you know your liquidity mining is going to run out soon. So I, I think this goes back to my original point that I made, which is your innovation is decentralization. So if you're using liquidity mining as a way to decentralize, then yeah, that, that's probably going to help you. But if you're just using it as a way to get short-term capital into the protocol without an end game, then no. I, I think it, it's, it's wrong to look at it from the perspective of like, you know, getting the capital in the protocol is the success metric. The decentralization is a success metric. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I think also something you touched on before saying that uh, right when Comp introduced their liquidity mining, then now there's heightened demand for DAI, right? And now like that impacts the, the DAI market. So now they're trying to scale the debt ceiling and introduce new collateral type to, to meet this demand. So it's not, it's not isolated to these protocols themselves, but um, more so yeah. impacts like the whole, the whole ecosystem. So one project's liquidity mining can still help a project that isn't necessarily doing it. Rising tide floats all boats. Exactly. Um, so I guess we'll kind of bridge uh, these next two topics. So moving on from yield farming to uh, risks inherent, but I guess yield farming also kind of brings about risks in and of itself. Uh, so is this just layering on like additional blow up risk to the whole system now that uh, we right people are just depositing dying compound only to borrow it to relend it to borrow it like all in a cycle to try to juice the returns uh, is this you know are, are we building a house of cards here I mean I would actually say that uh, like okay so the risk I touch on will actually be a, probably a related to yours a bit but for me it's probably oracle risk you know which I, I would talk about uh, first um, and it's true that as we've seen this value go up and up and up, usually you have a concept of scalable security, right? Which is basically uh, if my system relies on getting the price of an asset, right? To determine 
uh, whether an asset should be liquidated, whether my platform is properly collateralized, and all of this stuff, right? You do need to kind of scale your Oracle security as you're scaling your the volume you secure, right? So if you secure 500 million, you can't have the same approach as if you're securing 10 million or 20 million, right? So to me, I think that one of the inherent risks is basically uh, whenever we see oracles kind of being ran in a centralized manner and having extreme kind of uh, power in the platform, right? Um, and I don't see many examples of this now in DeFi, which is actually a good uh, a good thing. Like I think most plat most uh, projects are using decentralized oracles uh, today, you know, which is good. And I, I hope it keeps going this way. But one of the risks which I, I would probably foresee is really uh, an Oracle failure, right? Because Oracles are really at the core of everything happening in DeFi. You know, like basically uh, is the way you kind of see if a platform is properly collateralized is Oracles. The way uh, you decide on liquidations is also based on Oracles feeding the price of the asset, right? And I do hope that we keep uh, this approach of using uh, reliable, secure, decentralized Oracles, which can scale as the value uh, that your platform is securing scales, right? So having more nodes, uh, securing your price feeds, uh, et cetera, um, as, as kind of the value you're securing uh, keeps growing up, right? I think that's a really important one because that's one of the concepts which is often overlooked in DeFi. Like you do have two things which happen in DeFi at the, at the kind of layer tech stack, right? Like uh, it's basically you have the smart contract risk and you have the Oracle risk. Right, like those are the two main ones, in my opinion. Uh, the smart contract risk, mainly through audits, mainly through uh, like the platform, the underlying platform one is Ethereum, right? So we kind of hope that this one is secure by now, but we never know, right? But after five, six years, we have some very, some very strong guarantees, right? Then the smart contract risk, the smart contracts which are living on Ethereum, you have all the audits, you have a lot more kind of um, a lot more people. Uh, are are doing audits nowadays. Like you can see, for instance, Wi-Fi got audit, got maybe two, three audits uh, after you know uh, a week or two of uh, of launch, right? Like they got a lot of support from the auditing company. So we're really seeing this infrastructure, like this uh, kind of um, community of auditors who can make sure the smart contract is safe, or at least give. Um, like you can never have a full insurance, right? But you can basically check the smart contract, make sure. It's at least decently safe to be to be launched, etc. You have this also, right? And the second layer, which uh, which I think we need to be very careful on, is always this Oracle layer, right? And that's uh, the risk we've been concerned of uh, at Chainlink. And I think that risk is extremely important because through DeFi's, comp DeFi's composability, right? If one platform was to fail because they are using a centralized Oracle, and all the platforms are using if these platforms are um, kind of uh, taking risk from each other, right? So if you have this composability aspect, which you often have in DeFi, that could be a systemic risk, I think, to the whole kind of ecosystem, right? So that's one of the risks which uh, which I do definitely see, and it's inherent, right? Like the more value you get, uh, the more you need to to kind of uh, to be secure on this on the second layer, right? And that's why. Uh, you, you always need to be careful with these oracles and uh, with using reliable price feeds. So yeah, that's that's my take on uh, on this one. I think the composability issues are like a really like a really important flag. Like I think that a lot of people don't realize that audit companies audit the um, smart contract, but not the interactions the smart contract might have with other smart contracts on Ledger. Like if you look at what happened with BZX um, and the hack there. Like you, and the reason for that is actually auditing, properly auditing all of the possible combinations that can happen is basically a statistical impossibility when you have these kind of very complex operations happening across multiple applications and the ways that they interact with each other. Um, and so what you get is this sort of like complexity problem just inherent to a, a, a system that starts to look more, more and more like, you know, what you would get when you're looking at um, 
it, like interactions of multiple um, clouds of things like in chaos theory or whatever. But like from the point of view of, hey, I've got this application here and then this application here and they call each other and this one's using that one as a as a um, as an oracle, but that one's also using that one as an, that market price as an oracle. And you end up getting all of these interactions that you just can't even trace through that can end up creating massive um, sort of knock on effects in the ecosystem. And for me, that's sort of one of the the big risks that sort of that that stand um as sort of unsolvable like i don't i don't see a i don't see a a, a a a way that we can do that apart from continue to build good controls into the ways that uh smart contracts inter- interact with each other as well as the smart contracts have built themselves uh, i'm sure stanny and, and greg you guys have much more experience in that yeah i mean that's um it's it's really like difficult because you can't trust like manual audits uh basically it's it's basically air, air pairs and and looking into different kinds of combinations uh, of uh attack services and potential uh bugs and so forth but also kind of like you could uh do mathematical uh formal verification well ma- mathematical verification on on what the code can do and, and what kind of uh, outputs it has, but you you also need to write those properties to to basically see what you're verifying. So it's a very very complex work. And then you can do fuzzing where you uh, you basically are testing in a way that you add different kinds of transactions and you are changing the the uh, the scope of the parameters and and basically seeing like what kind of inputs uh, produce different kinds of outputs. But it's still very difficult. And I, I think. Um, uh, it, it will be probably like this for a uh, quite a long time and 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 i think it's a uh, uh it's a reason where uh the risk is has to be borne by some particular entity like either it's it's insurance options or or the the token holders uh and and i think even diversely it it's not an um kind of like a uh, common to understand in a way that maybe you could uh, take an insurance, for example, from from Nexus, and still you have uh, kind of like a collateral as a last resort by by the token holders, and that's uh, pretty fine uh, because it it also like sharing the risk lowers uh, costs uh, eventually. So, but I, for us, it's it's very difficult. I mean, now uh, when we started to develop things, we we build it very quickly, uh, DeFi primitives, and 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 deployed them quite soon after audits into mainnet. And now the situation is is basically different because there is so much funds at stake. We can't develop that fast anymore, and 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 kind of like we try to innovate, but we we try to also kind of understand that uh, we have to innovate in a scale uh, and at the same time because it, it's so costly for us to innovate at the same time. I think I think the most important concept when analyzing risk is that it, it's not the risk you know about that gets you, it's the one you don't see. And the only way to truly make die is, you know, the entire construct of die is about redundancy. You have vaults that are over collateralized. Uh, Beyond that, you have the maker token, you have governance. There's there's several layers between the die holder and the you know end result of a black swan event. So you know we have Oracle security modules where you could freeze the oracles, or uh, we even have a, a function called emergency shutdown, where in absolute worst case scenario you could trigger redemption for die, where you could say, okay, you're holding die. Come quick, claim one dollar of collateral at the previous valid or oracle price. So there's like five layers of redundancy abstracting the user away from any kind of risk, let alone trying to figure out the individual risk that they might face. Um, yeah, th- th- those are all really good points. Uh, so it's something I've kind of spend a lot of time thinking about is right, like DeFi has given us this beautiful level of composability where we can stack all, all of these little money Legos on top and create fundamentally new products, right? Like we can provide liquidity to an automated automated market maker and then use our claim on that LP pool to uh, be used as collateral for a loan. And like this can greatly increase capital efficiency, which is a good thing, but we're also creating incredibly convoluted uh, products that like are, I mean, too complex for people that are in the weeds to understand, let alone like anyone else. And it almost kind of starts feeling like, you know, back in the 
like mortgage crisis where we're having CDOs on CDOs on CDOs and uh, just all this like slice and dicing financial engineering that creates a, a level of risk that, you know, can blow up the whole system or just because like fundamentally no one understands it truthfully, even though they claim they do. Um, so like, are we just gradually making our way to the, the system that we're trying to bring down? I don't think so. I, I have I have a strong opinion on the whole concept of the the opacity versus uh, understanding debate of 2008, which is you, you often find people splitting into two camps: people that say, "Oh, the whole economy collapses; nobody could understand these products," and then the other camp saying, "No, the the economy collapsed because nobody knew it was in the products in the first place." And that's the camp I'm in. I think that if you have transparency, you are doing the best you can do. There's people can are capable of understanding complexity. The problem in 2008 was that that complexity was sitting behind in brick walls that you couldn't see through. You know, you, you could have CDO squared and if everybody could go to Etherscan and see all the mortgages inside the CDOs, we never would have had the financial crisis because if only one person had to go do that, they would have done it. The issue is that nobody could do that. E even the banks that were selling the assets didn't know what were inside of them. So I, I think it's a transparency issue, not a complexity issue. I, I agree on the transparency that basically we see like way better probably than in 2008 because of like uh, you don't know the counterparties, uh, basically exposure. Uh, the, of course, one thing I'm, I'm a bit scared is, is uh, basically when we tokenize different kinds of assets and we give them some sort of value or, or, or credit trading uh, and, and that was the kind of the same thing that happened in, in 2008 when, when the uh, the mortgages was, were packaged basically in, in certain credit ratings. And I, I mean, those values were changing and, and basically uh, probably not uh, accurately even valued always. And, and what's interesting here is that uh, we're, uh, we have now more transparency because of the, like the, by default of the Ethereum uh, transparency and the public ledger and kind of we can avoid that kind of stuff and uh, how to avoid it also one way is, is the governance so if you have a governance that basically uh knows what's what's happening and and what kind of products there is is, is basically sold or or issued that that is like a one way to to help and I, I think like um for example if you look at the governance systems that we had for example even even maker system like there's so much discussion on every single parameter and, and in general, like in, in Ethereum, uh, like so many people are participating and, and with different backgrounds, that diversity is, is something that uh, is game changing, I think. Yeah, I like just to give a counter to that, like I think that we've done very well as an industry since 2017 to uh, build cautiously and build sort of like missionaries in, in our community and all of that kind of stuff. But I think that we're starting to see a real pickup of, of people putting money into things without really checking. Um, and I think that's going to increase over the next um, sort of three months or so um, that there is obviously going to be opportunities for people to hide behind complexity, even if it's on ledger and I can, and I can, and I can go and audit it. There's still going to be that risk um, that, people are just like, wow, that's an amazing return, like APR or whatever that's being offered. I'm just going to put my money in that. I don't understand it. I just want that number. Um, and uh, so I, I, I think to answer, like, I'm, I, I, I'm with you, Greg, from the point of view of we didn't know what was inside those assets. So that's why we bought them. Um, but I think that there was also just a, wow, like I can get a AAA rated uh, financial instrument that yields 8%, sign me up. It fits with my LP agreement and I don't really want to see how the sausage is made. Like I think that there's similar, going to be similar motivated reasoning in this as well. So there's definitely some like moral hazard that, 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 can be, that could be happening in the DeFi space in the near future for sure. Yeah, but don't we have to outline like what we can even solve? Like what you just described is basic human greed. You, you can't eliminate greed in humanity. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a question of whether or not that greed will drive a systemic issue. 
right? It's like if we can get to the point where the greed is driving a certain type of product to be made, which is driving more greed, which is then driving a systemic issue that causes a massive blow up that fundamentally means the failure of some of the actual good systems that have been built. And I'm, I, I, I'm like sort of, I'm, I'm bullish on that not happening, but I think that there is a risk that it could. And I think it's really important, like, and it's the responsibility of the community to sort of point out when those things are happening and going, like, guys, this is really, really dangerous. Like, we should be careful. I, I think you just described central banking in the 21st century. But... Are you saying that printing money isn't a good thing? Is that, is that, I don't understand what you're talking about. Um, yeah, that's great. Because I, I, I asked that question kind of hoping to get some diversity of opinion because like I find myself torn on that um, because I don't know, I, I feel like a useful way to think about it is, you know, g- going back to the, the mortgage crisis thinking uh, of, I'm sure you guys have seen like the big short where Christian Bale, uh, M- Michael Burry's characters, uh, you know, going through those heaps of papers trying to find out, yeah, how the sausage is made. Um, and then finally being like, oh, like these individual mortgages, like these are going to go into fault and then the products built on top of them are going to collapse. But with the system we have now, uh, we can make those heaps of paper available to every single person at any point in time. So like you can, right, I can go on, uh, like do an analytics and see the exact collateralization ratio and um, any other derivative metric of these like loan systems to see their general health, uh, which is something that's really uniquely enabled by this system um, to prevent that. So I guess it should be a matter of like creating then guardrails to prevent malicious behavior or just at least tame our greed so uh we don't get caught into that path that let us uh let us astray um so to to move on to another type of risk i think uh peers this might be a good good place for you to start but uh given you're building um another another layer one i'm sure you've thought about this a lot but uh since like right now almost all, if not, you know, say the vast majority of DeFi is built on Ethereum, and they're about to go uh, a, a massive uh, change in the, the protocol itself with the C2 upgrade. Uh, do you think that presents a risk, just given that everything's built on top and like there is a lot of just operational uncertainty and like how this is going to work? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, um, it's it's gonna be, it's a huge engineering task that's been going on for a very long time. Uh, Ethereum two, it's a massively complicated beast. It's going, it's like it's unfurling in 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 like a painfully slow way from the point of view of how fast the the DeFi industry is moving at the moment. Like Z, uh, zk rollups and um, sort of second layer solutions don't really scale some of the important things about DeFi, like atomic composability between contracts. And so, like, I think that for to Stanny's point, like when he when when you're building at the start, you can iterate really quickly. Uh, but when there's like a load of value on top of it, you've got to move more slowly. And Ethereum is essentially intrinsically dealing with the billions and billions of dollars the value that is uh, is running in all of these smart contracts that exist on top of these ledgers. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a really interesting time to uh to sort of watch this transition uh from proof of work to proof of stake from like sort of starting to go into a sharded environment all of the teething problems that's going to face that all of the teams that are building on top of ethereum are going to face um so uh intrinsically a huge amount of risk to the system which is why it's moving slowly but then that's also presenting risk to the system i think that the advantage that people like radix have is we are able to build a system that doesn't yet have value on it so we're able to move a lot quicker whilst continuing to learn from the ecosystem that currently exists but we don't we're not we don't see ethereum as like uh, the person that we want to beat we see them as the be- being the the people that we want to be as close to as possible and help take some of that load and help make sure that the ecosystem is able to thrive through these periods because ultimately this is this is a community activity everything like even building another layer one is a community activity that requires and the only reason that we build value is this interoperability and like so if there's ways in which we can help the DeFi ecosystem expand whilst Ethereum's going through these teething pains, amazing. But I think that it is a huge lift. And I think that a lot of projects are going to be facing problems in this transition period. Yeah. And I, I want to say that basically, at least at Aave, like we're very, uh, we believe that liquidity uh, will move and not just liquidity, but value and, and interactions between chains. And we're always basically trying to 
figure out like uh, what could be the next step for us basically looking and and kind of like expanding and i i, I think it's um uh, there, there there needs to be different kinds of um uh, uh platforms and 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 those platforms will have their own liquidity uh networks and and their own applications and we just want to be part of that i mean one of the things i really really like enjoy is the fact that actually like the whole uh, blockchain or like the 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 whole ecosystem is kind of like a, a big big book of history because like every mark we leave leaves piece of history there you know people who are yield farming uh, depositing to Aave, printing, uh, basically die with Ether, and 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 you know all of this stuff, and 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 basically every oracle call that that basically happens, these are like part of the history. You can actually go, let's say, years from now back and look like what what happened uh, like in in that uh, era, and like we don't see it because we're interacting so closely. But at some point, it's it could be like a fascinating to get these interactions like as a as a some sort of like a story just my two way <laughs> so one of uh one of the reasons right like this whole e2 um developments being like watched so closely and like i think especially in the last like couple weeks um is that ethereum is just becoming very bloated right now all these DeFi transactions are uh taking up like a lot of the bandwidth and that's why gas fees are uh rising to incredibly high levels which kind of pricing out the the small guys so uh matthew i think this could be good for you because argent uh you guys cover all gas costs so is that, is that a risk that kind of keeps you guys up at night i mean uh are, are you worried that could become unsustainable so yeah just a kind of important correction there is we now don't cover the gas for much at all because it was costing tens of thousands <laughs> of dollars a day um so look we we were clear when we launched that we think gas is a pain point for people, but not just in terms of the cost, just that concept of just adding that barrier of the fee as an extra hurdle. If you're trying to tell people this is the future of money, but oh, as opposed to sending with Revolut or Monzo or something, you've now got all this stuff. You've got to calculate the price. You've got to get extra assets for it. It's a burden. So when we were launching and when prices were that much lower, we told people we would cover it as much as possible and just abstract it away from them for as long as possible. And then it has got to a stage where, um, you know, you can see on F gas station, whatever they call it, the list of big guzzlers or whatever it is, we were spending a lot. Luckily, we're still able to partner with um, DAPs to subsidize access. So Aave has very kindly subsidized it for the last month, pulled together and Maker is still subsidizing it. Um, and I think, so there's the cost element. And I think one important point that we already raised is, does it mean that you're only appealing to whales? Um, and that's really not the direction we want to take Argent or we want to take Ethereum. So that's why we've been um, researching layer two for ages and already started working on it with various partners. Um, but even aside from the cost, I think there are things you can do in terms of the user experience to A, be more trans transparent with people about when there's congestion, when the fees are high, how to make it easy for them to pay in a range of ERC20 tokens, um, and just trying to lower those barriers. But yeah, it, it's obviously a, it's a big issue. Um, and we just hope that it gets to a stage where we can go back to, again, targeting people in Argentina and things like this for moving smaller amounts of money and making Ethereum more accessible. So looks like we got about five minutes left before the Q&A. Um, so I'll end off with kind of like a, a high level question uh, to, to everyone here, but what is it gonna take for DeFi to like really cross the chasm, as I say, to uh, become something that can be used by the everyday person? Um, or uh, does that not even have to be the end state for this whole thing to be successful? Can it be used for just, you know, the financial plumbing to power our, uh, derivatives and exchange system that like, you know, these big financial players can run to run the world financial economy, but like, you know, the average person doesn't really need to know how it works or interface with it. Until yeah. we have real world assets in the blockchain ecosystem, especially, you know, and that's where, you know, people like Chainlink really come in to, to get that underwriting data onto the blockchain. Until we have that, we can't, I don't even think we can call ourselves successful. We're basically beta products because 
you can only go so far financing speculation on crypto assets. Where is all the yield going to come from in the future if not from genuine borrowers in the legacy economy? That's just my point. Yeah, I agree there. I would also say that, I mean, to me, the end state is indeed to get as many real world assets as possible on the blockchain. The end goal also is really, like, we don't want people to understand how it works. We just want people to use it. And it's very similar to the internet. No one understands how, I mean, not no one, but most people don't see how the internet works, right? Like, they check Netflix, they check Twitter, they check Gmail, all of this stuff, right? And they don't understand the plumbing behind it. I think that's our goal as well. To, to me, to be honest, the way DeFi succeeds is by keep like continuing to do what it's doing right now. And if we keep doing, like if we keep seeing what we're seeing right now in the traditional world, where basically we see you know, huge amounts of money printing, uh, no transparency whatsoever to where this money goes, all of these things, in my opinion, do really make uh, DeFi shine, right? Because next to the incredible kind of opacity which you have right now going on in the traditional world and in the way central banks are acting where you know if there is a distraction or well, let's uh, print some money and <laughs> you know no one will look where it's going uh, I, I think with DeFi and kind of with ethereum and all of these super transparent systems this can't happen right so if ethereum just keeps and kind of the, the crypto world in general just keeps being what it is right now keeps evolving keeps innovating and keeps getting more and more assets on chain and we keep seeing what we're seeing in, you know, next door, then I think we're in the right way to, to have this end goal of people using DeFi, using this traditional, this new system without even understanding it. So yeah, that's my two cents there. Two I, I, I think I think that like the more we sort of um, go down this the path to uh, the early adopters, um, uh, sorry, to the late, sorry, the early majority, big of our, not the early adopters, the early majority, the more we see this sort of like segmentation, um, of purpose, like the, the, the protocol, like going to Johan's example, like the protocol should be invisible to most everyday users in the same way that TCP IP is, um, the next layer of these sort of like financial products and services that fundamentally allow you to reconstitute assets and to bring liquidity across functions and users are like is the next layer that i also think is going to end up being abstracted away i think it is things like argent uh, that is the interface that these users are going to be going through because they represent this um beautiful experience that can end up being so abstracted from the underlying, but have this advantage that wasn't there previously with people like Robin Hood and um, Merry Trader or these kind of applications because they had to build the stack underneath it. Like Argent doesn't have to do that. Argent can just focus on, I mean, not to not to sort of like move away from the engineering lift that you guys are doing all day every day, but that you have this opportunity for a complete competition of uh, products and services for your users whilst creating a beautiful user experience that you can move assets seamlessly through. And I think for the point of view of the early majority, it's just going to get more and more convenient. Like it's going to be better and better to hold a wider and wider array of assets in these type of applications because they are interfaces on the back end to these this marketplace of uh, financial services and the assets that exist for it, you know being able to be used in those financial services that will continue to grow thanks Chris. i think we better not mess it up then if our role is uh, like that but um for us i think yeah we're really interested in the use case i, I still don't think that there's that ability to just turn to a friend that's completely out of crypto and in a short sentence explain the value proposition of DeFi and like get it like you can't really talk to that like fair and more transparent blah 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 decentralized finance like what is that killer use case the kind of the taxi that can be delivered in a few minutes the easy photo sharing for us I think that there's so much potential in DeFi and I think we'll quickly see those use cases emerge and it could be from our perspective at least the kind of um, high interest savings account for anyone or a global um, Venmo for anyone or, you know, more private transactions. And then the other side of it is like uh, login to various um, centralized apps and things like that. So I think, yeah, until we see those use cases, I think we'll, 
will really struggle with huge mainstream adoption. But I have no doubt at the rate that DeFi is innovating um, and the interest it's getting from great teams that we'll get to that stage pretty quickly. Awesome. So I guess we can move on to some of the, the Q&A. Uh, looks like we got a lot of great questions from everyone. Um, not sure we'll be able to get to them all, but I'll, I'll do my best here. Uh, so kind of p- parsing through them here, uh, I think that this is a, a really good question. But uh, what, what is the panel's thoughts on censorship in DeFi? Uh, we've already seen Center, the company behind USDC, uh, freeze an Ethereum wallet for sending and uh, transacting USDC. Uh, is this a good or a bad thing? Um, and I would actually also, also like to kind of add on to that, uh, like Greg, especially, like, is that a, a risk that you guys um, were concerned about, like in adding USDC as collateral, like given that there is uh, the potentiality of right, center being compelled to, you know, freeze the assets and maker because, you know, maybe they, they don't like, the government doesn't like the system or, uh, so how, how do you kind of think through those risks? Yeah, th- this, this is the core function of maker holders. Maker holders are there to sit there, you know, stone faced and you tell them the most absurd risk in the world and they say, this is the price. <laughs> they, they are a, a supposed to be a decentralized risk pricing machine. So no risk is, in my opinion, too dangerous for the maker holders to price. It's just a matter of doing so accurately. Uh, when they look at USDC and other centralized assets that do have that uh, you know, seizure function, that's just another risk they have to consider, just like they have to consider the risk of Tether imploding and the liquidity dropping out on every crypto market across the board. Like they, That's their job. And the important thing is that at the end of the day, we end up with a pool of diversified risk, not just diversified collateral, not just diversified types of collateral, diversified risk of collateral. You know, you could have two centralized stable coins that have completely different risk associated with them. So, yeah, I mean, I I think that it's it's almost a good thing that that happened. And I I know I sound like uh, a Bitcoin maximalist right now. Everything's good for Bitcoin. But (laughs) um I, I think it was a good thing because it, it forced our community to acknowledge that there are other kinds of risk. And now they're getting into the habit of pricing them, where if you price risk accurately, then there is no such thing as a risk in general. Like, it, I think this goes back to sort of what we started at with, with like, if we want, if we truly want to reshape the financial uh, system, we have to accept that it has to interact with the real world. Interacting with the world, real world fundamentally comes with playing. Uh, to the rules of that world and how it inter- interacts and like some things do need to have centralized control like even shares like sometimes if you've got a merger going on you need to be able to pull back the shares if you've got a majority of shareholders who have said yes to it that you you need those controls for just because the world has worked out through process of legal um, arbitration and making laws and all this kind of stuff, some good practices and ways of working. And in, in many ways, a legal system like can be seen as a decentralized governance tool. It's just like at a much bigger scale. You have a representative democracy that makes rules and then those rules is enforced by courts, which, you know, have like, like, yes, there's lots of problems with it. But fundamentally, there is a huge amount of value that can benefit in an incredible way from being able to be on these platforms. But to be able to do that, we have to accept that certain things are functions that have to have to occur and to greg's point like it's it gets priced in it gets programmed in and how that needs to interact and it ends up being more nuanced than just the story of decentralized assets and and like your keys are your own and all that kind of stuff like fundamentally the world is more nuanced than that but if we want to be serious about in bringing bringing in these assets we have to accept that certain types of assets come with these requirements associated with them we can't get away from that I mean, I would say also that one of the beauties with blockchain and crypto in general is that it's uh, kind of an alternative way to do things, right? Like these assets are on the blockchain, you're free to use them or you're free not to use them. Like you can opt in or opt out, right? And just like uh, Greg was saying, where they have total freedom to say, you know, what should the interest rate be? If if we're going to use USDC as a collateral, how much do you pay for this, right? Like what's the premium? Uh, to have to factor in all of these uh, risks associated with centralization and stuff, right? So in my opinion, I don't think we should have ever a binary view. I think it should always be the freedom of uh, users to choose what they want to use or not, which assets they think 
uh, make sense for them or not to. And the same thing for uh, kind of communities and protocols who are driving, like the communities who are driving these protocols, right? They have the right to determine which asset should be part of this protocol or not. And if it's part of it, then to factor in the risk ratio of doing so, right? So I think that's uh, it's very important. Like we should always strive to have as many um, assets as possible on chain because it gives more freedom and more options to people ultimately. And I think this space is basically built on the, on options and freedom, right? Like, uh, do you want this traditional system where you have to accept this currency and you don't control, like, you know, you have to accept the way we mean this currency and all of this stuff, or do you want to opt into this other alternative system, which is fully transparent, which is decentralized and all of these options, right? And the more we can uh, dig into this, uh, giving options to users and protocol, the better we are. So. Yeah, and I agree, like, basically, it's all about, end of the day, the community deciding what they basically want the protocol to be, what kind of asset they should be in, and what kind of tools. And and, and I, I, I think that's that's the, the thing. I mean, the more the community decides, more value uh, it will have. Like, that's, like um, that's one of the things we noticed now that we're moving towards more decentralized uh, governance is that we... We basically don't want to have a, a a big say, and we want people to tell us like what to develop, and other people to tell what to develop, and and that's like the 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 beauty of the system. And I I think it's 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 going to be interesting because we'll see like similar products on the market, and 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 they just differ in different kinds of uh, user base and community, and that that's pretty uh, nice to see. Awesome. So uh, moving on. Um... It's an interesting question. I guess one I haven't really thought all that much through. But uh, so with with growing support for central bank digital currencies, uh, how do you guys see the dy- dynamics of those affecting uh, DeFi projects? As long as people hold it in Argent, I don't mind. And, and deposit to Aave. <laughs> those points are funny, but also have an underlying uh, message, which is it, it all depends whether they build it on Ethereum, right? Or at least a network that can connect to Ethereum, because that's where all these protocols are currently built. And if you're building a new chain and not connecting to Ethereum, then you're kind of siloed. So I think that there's a very important point here about interconnectivity between all these networks. I mean, even in Maker, a, a very rapidly growing portion of the collateral portfolio is in wrapped Bitcoin. So, you know, we need that interconnectivity between networks. Otherwise, it really doesn't do anything for any of us. And, and, and like the central bank digital currency makers feel exactly the same way. Like, you, like having spoken to a few of the teams that are sort of building the first systems uh, at various stages, um, the, the, the central, central banks actually surprisingly care a lot about things like interoperability. I mean, maybe not surprisingly when you think about how inter- in, interrelated the entire financial system is, but like, you know, England's central bank cares about its, if it does a dig- central bank digital currency, that it fundamentally works with the US system. Um, but equally, they care about it working with the new innovations that exist on things like public ledgers like Ethereum or Radix. That matters too, because what they care about is the money that they create providing utility to the users that they're servicing, which is their, which is the, 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 the population. So they really do care about making sure that this enables their populace to more easily access the things that they care about. They're not trying to stand in the way. They're trying to go, like, if this stimulates the economy and gives people more choice and more options and better products, then we're for that. And so they really care about that. Interestingly, just as a side note, they also really care about privacy a lot more than people think they do. Like, central banks, when they're thinking about replacing cash, especially for smaller transactions that fall below the AML threshold, are like, we really want this to be private. So I think that, and um, with the exception of certain countries, of course, um, the, 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 there is there is more connection between the ideology of the central bank and the ideology of the of the public ledger in terms of decentralization, um, uh, anti fragility, interoperation, the ability to give users access to financial services and products like that runs really deeply through because fundamentally what they care about is the economy. And like all of these things feed into the economy in one, in, in one way or another. So I think that, yeah, central bank digital currency is a great thing. 
uh, going to enable more programmable money in the system that fundamentally can be used in these decentralized applications and on these protocols. The job that we have, like as protocol makers, as decentralized application makers, and as uh, community members, is making sure that these things can actually be expressed there as quickly as possible so that we can work out new ways of using them in the economies that we're building. Do you think they want it to be private? Like, I actually don't know. Like, do they want it to be private? Truly, or do they just want it to be private to everybody but them? No, truly private, truly private. So um, I, I can't talk about which particular countries, but la- large European countries, the the the, uh, the the central bank has a view that if we're going to be replacing cash, we don't want to remove individual consumer privacy from that in the same way that, like, we have rules about. AML, but those rules are gradiated, they're nuanced. It's not just, you know, AML everything. It, it's about making sure that there's just not there's 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 enough uh non-friction to actually transact, um, but enough friction at the high end to make sure that like egregious levels of money laundering and things like that doesn't occur. But it's like it in exactly the same way that you have a balance between uh, security and usability, right? Like if you make a si- system too secure, it's not usable. And if you make a system too usable, sometimes it's not secure. Like there's a fundamental, I think there's a fundamental um, uh, friction between those two things uh, in, in DeFi and in, and, in, and in programmable finance in like this difficulty between, well, if we put up all these barriers to getting uh, like AML KYC or getting into a platform, then people aren't going to use it and we're not going to be able to grow the innovation quickly. But if we go the other way, then we end up with money laundering and things like that. So that there's a balance. But central bankers care about that just as much as we do, surprisingly. Yeah, I mean, um, my, my two cents on this for what it's worth, like at least from the discourse that I've heard like in the US or I'd say almost certainly in like places like China that are starting to seriously consider like, th- I think they're leaning a little bit more towards privacy for everyone but them. Um, yeah. and, 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 and with that respect, though, I think that that can actually be an effective way to kind of like red pill people into what I consider like true digital currencies. Because like when it comes down to it, the only institution that people trust less than banks, right? Like right now we hold our money in banks. They, you know, they can see our tr- transaction history or whatever. We're cool with it. And we don't even trust banks, but the only person we trust less than banks is the government. <laughs> yeah. So if the, if the Federal Reserve is, um, you know, complete access to our financial history, like people might be like, I don't really like that. And kind of then red pill themselves into uh, Bitcoin or, you know, stablecoin like DAI, uh, which could be a boon there. Yeah, um, I, de- I definitely would nuance with what I'm saying is there are com- countries like China, which definitely hmm. do want an all-seeing eye. And there's countries that take a completely different approach. Like in the same way that many countries, at least in Europe because of GDPR laws, like companies are going like, actually, we don't want this user data. It's, a, it's just a big risk to us. And like, it, it's a privacy concern because if we get hacked, we'd like, and if central banks have that data, like it's also available to people to come in and maliciously act, uh, like access it as well. And if what if that got leaked? Like, what does that what does that mean for the country's faith in the currency? Like, that's actually a real existential risk as well. So I think some countries are taking one person, some are taking another. But I think it's more than just oh, wouldn't it be great if we saw and had an all seeing eye? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a very promising thing to to hear as well. Um, so with uh, with another question here. Uh, And actually, I'm interested to hear your guys' thoughts on this because it's something I've been looking and like researching into a lot more, but bridging the worlds of Bitcoin and Ethereum. So uh, the the, the question is, um, can you guys talk about if anyone's like working on like Bitcoin or Rootstock uh, or it's like layer twos other than wrapped Bitcoin, which uh, for those that haven't followed uh, is a tokenized version of Bitcoin that lives that is custodied by BitGo and then just offers a one to one peg there and it's grown insanely over the last couple months i think you know there's almost like 200 million dollars worth on it or around that um so it's come very prominent but uh yeah i would be curious to hear if you guys are you know looking at that or like other uh, layer two forms of bitcoin on ethereum there's a bunch (laughs) yeah i think the the kind of like uh I, I think that the, this uh, bridging is pretty interesting because, like, I mean, if if you get assets to move from one chain to another, uh, I mean, that's 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 pretty uh, 
that's that's pretty cool stuff. I, I don't know what if that will be possible of all of the assets, like how how those like more older like um, kind of like a change will react in in, in those. But I, I think I think moving moving value to network is important, and it also allows kind of like a hedging in in one way uh, in diversification. Uh, I I'm definitely for 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 getting uh, Bitcoin into uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> and so forth. I think there's sort of two approaches that people are largely taking to this. Like, I mean, there's more than two, but like the ones that I sort of broadly categorize it into is ones that, like, so Polkadot and Cosmos um, are taking where you sort of have to have both chains like expressly integrate each other to make it work. And then there's the sort of approach that Ren protocol is taking where it's like, well, if we can decentralize the custody of the the the, the um, keys that represent the ownership of these assets, we can kind of move them between ledgers without there necessarily being an explicit integration. And like wrapped BTC is the is 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 Ren's like starting point, but they're already decentralizing that. I think that's really promising, and that's probably more likely where you're going to see interoperability of assets uh, across ledgers because it's just able to move more quickly in theory um, than than sort of the per chain integration across both sort of like both integrations that needs to happen both ways with things like Polkadot and Cosmos. But like, obviously we're looking at both. Like we just want to make sure that everything interoperates and interacts and that value can move as easily as possible between these places, because ultimately that's what gives the consumer the most benefit. It's not really like they don't care what we, as we've been talking, they just want the access to the products and services that they care about. And our job is just to make those roads as easily as po- easy as possible. And there's loads of innovation that's happening that can make that happen. Yeah, and I, I think it really just comes down to a matter of like scalability versus trust. Like, do people actually care if it's a more like trustless version of Bitcoin on Ethereum, or do they want it to be, you know, the most efficient scale, like scalable model where I can deposit Bitcoin, get it back, and then uh, people can arb that efficiently? Um, where like Ren, there's a like much higher capital lockup requirement, and it's less efficient, but like okay, I can do this in a trustless manner. Yeah, I would say also uh, really quick is that one of the main things here, I mean, that really goes into the whole narrative of bringing more and more assets onto Ethereum, right, to increase the value and people having the choice or not to use it. I think something very interesting, which we need to be provided at some point and which we would have to to be working on is basically the kind of uh, guarantee, which is always maybe some kind of Oracle system, for instance, which could check that the Bitcoin, which is locked on the Bitcoin chain, would actually be collateralizing fully something like WBTC or something like RENBTC, right? To make sure that basically there is no kind of under collateralization in such a system, right? Checking that basically for every proxy token which you've issued on Ethereum to represent the ownership of this Bitcoin, it's actually backed by a Bitcoin on the native chain, which is locked fully, right? And that I think is something, some kind of trust guarantee, which we need to be provided at uh, some point, and which we're hoping to provide. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I do think that the more assets you add on chain, of course, the, the better. And you have so many layers of security you can add on top as you get more and more value, right? Because currently, WBTC is what two hundred million dollars, I think, uh, on uh, on Ethereum. It's starting to be a big, a big amount, right? So adding this kind of security guarantees where we can basically check the collateralization ratio is super important and uh, will become super critical. And here's uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, so what are the top three barriers or problems that need to be solved uh, in order to get a DeFi mortgage on your home? I think I can take that. Uh, so one is going to be, you know, what regulatory regime does this asset fit in when it actually enters the protocol, because that is a regulated activity and you're going to need to play by the rules. Uh, the second is what do the oracles look like? And the third is what does a liquidation process look like? You know, how do we get the asset out of the system? So really it's it's three three core features of Maker. How do we get the, the asset into the system? But specifically, you know, what regulations need to apply to it? How do we maintain the asset into the system? So specifically, since you can't just put somebody's uh, name, address, and mortgage payments on the blockchain, what's the compromise in terms of you know using metadata instead of absolute transparency in that uh, oracle? And then finally, you know, in the liquidation process, since it's a regulated asset, 
what does it need to go through in order to actually get out of the protocol and back into the proper investors' hands that want to hold it? Johan, have you guys been working on uh, getting housing prices onto uh, on, onto Maker so they can uh, get houses as collateral? You can, we can do this easily. You know? <laughs> you know, like, uh, it's, it's something we're definitely interested in. And I mean, on our side, we always work where if we have demand, we do it because usually uh, the system we have is extremely modular, right? Like we can fetch prices, but we can also get uh, housing prices. We can get uh, weather insurance, like weather data, you know, for, for any country. Uh, so it's really based on demand. And it's something we could definitely work on. Greg, I'm happy to discuss after, uh, after this call. <laughs> I, I, I like. I think that there is um, an extra layer that it needs to be built. Like um, property tokenization of property has been something that people have been trying to do, and like raising rel- like various sums of money, some very impressive and some tiny, um, since 2016. Um, and like a big part of this is sort of the liquidity problem of those tokens because underlying they're essentially. Uh, like individually they are specific risk assets like i have to like have some good way of uh, working out this particular property's value and risk profile um like securitization was the was the is the solution that the, the financial markets use for that i think that to get there we need two extra things on top of what greg was talking about one is sort of more liquidity in the system itself like we're not quite at the um repackaging of mortgages stage um because that that's a that requires like quite a lot of capital that's willing to take a relatively low yield like let's face it like yield farming looks a lot more attractive than 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 mortgage uh, returns um but that sort of securitization the ability to abstract and create a diversified portfolio of assets uh and then the liquidity that's required to make sure that that can be funded on ledger is really what's going to be necessary to go from the issuance of a mortgage on ledger all the way to a sort of a marketplace that can that can take that uh, on the back end so i think there's a few layers still to go so there's another question. Uh, what subsector in DeFi should be taking off? So looking at exchanges, uh, stable coins, credit lending, insurance, derivatives. Um, I think let's. Uh, I'd be curious to point this towards Stani because you, you kind of touched on uh, insurance and like the the need for that and right like decentralized put options where people can like protect themselves against a lot of the risks we mentioned earlier. So um, I'm curious if you have any like further thoughts on that or. Yeah, I think that space is something where, where we could put like a um, good amount of um, uh, innovation. I, I think there's interesting projects already doing uh, some quite interesting uh, uh, options. For example, the uh, uh, POTS Finance and, and Potion and, and also Nexus Mutual's in actual insurance. But I, I think like so some of the risks that are in DeFi, they are uh, comparable something that you could use uh, credit default swaps and and I, I think that's something that uh, might be next uh, that you could basically build and there you actually need some sort of like uh, oracle support in terms of like validating uh, when when a default arises unless you have some sort of like a smart contract balance related thing um, I, I I think what we will see also uh, is is um, kind of like also I would I would want to see some aggregation because um, we've seen now that there's like DEX aggregators like pa- Paraswap basically building um, kind of like liquidity for, for people to consume without slippage. I would kind of think like, would there be some sort of aggregation of, of writing these new financial products? For example, could you just go uh, into a dashboard and basically uh, search where is the most profitable for you to to write an option uh, as as there's like multiple options uh, primitives coming up and i i think there's like the 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 amount of efficiency the the uh, we have in defi in terms of when you when you get the value into the system and how you could basically just shuffle it around it's just uh, it's, it's 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 amazing i just hope the 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 the, the gas cost was uh, lower but uh i mean that's that's it is what it is now. <laughs> yeah, I, I I agree. I'm I'm super bullish on on derivatives. Um, like I think that <clears throat> in terms of um, things like perpetual futures and perpetual swaps, uh, and like what 
um, DYDX has, has been doing, uh, what like some of these um, sort of new protocols that haven't yet been launched um, are, are going to be doing around this. It's a, there's clearly a demand for it. Um, synthetics is also like, as in synthetics, the protocol, um, rather than synthetics as a synthetic asset, which is what they create. Um, I think they're sort of leading the way in the way that we can not just um, go, like take one asset and use it as collateral, but how we can essentially take one asset and turn it into another asset. And I think that from the point of view of being able to create the things around risk mitigation that are really important, um, it's going to be really, it's going to be great. But also from the point of view of um, like speculation does drive this, this industry still, I think there's just going to add the next level of speculation um, that's, that's made possible on top of these ledgers as well. So like there's, there's, and that will drive more, people in and it'll drive more assets in and it'll drive more use cases for the for the system um so yeah from our side i think we would just like to see some um like nexus mutual is interesting i think insurance would be great we get asked about that a lot um and as we've brought up many times like having synthetic assets um getting exposure to things like normal stocks and stuff like that could be really interesting just to something that appeals to any kind of mainstream user making it your real financial hub I think could be very cool and I'm sure will come eventually. Yeah, it looks like we're, uh, we're coming up on time here. Um, this, uh, this was awesome. This was incredibly insightful uh, for myself and I'm sure everyone else uh, learned a thing or two here, or at least I hope so. But um, yeah, with that, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. And thank you guys for uh, giving great, great responses here. Thank you yeah. so much for moderating, thanks, Jack. Thank you for everyone coming.